Last week we talked uh, about routines as an introduction to sequencing tools in SuperCollider. Uh, so routines as a means of generating a sequence of data that we can access incrementally with next. Um, routines being structures that can be reset at any time. And routines can also be played with the play message, which uh, will automatically step through the actions of a routine and treat each wait or yield time as a duration in beats. And we also looked at uh, quantizing and um, uh, uh, you know, quantizing and, and uh, modifying the tempo at which routines play by playing them on a custom tempo clock. And we looked a little bit at scheduling on tempo clock as well. So we're going to continue with sequencing this week and introduce a family of classes called patterns. Uh, patterns, it's, just, it's a, fa a large family of classes. They all start with a capital P. That's usually how you can uh, uh, identify them. There are probably some, I think there are some classes that start with P but are not patterns, but every class that is a pattern starts with a capital P. Uh, and patterns are essentially uh, a score language for music and data and sound. It's, uh, essentially they are pre-packaged algorithmic units that represent a certain algorithmic sequence. And there's lots of different flavors. Uh, they are very much a language within a language. So I mean, it's, if, if SuperCollider feels very new, takes a little while to get your brain around that. And then even when you feel very comfortable with the basics of making sound in SuperCollider, it can be quite a challenge to, to really digest broadly the pattern library and find the right combination of patterns that will produce the desired sequence. So it takes a bit of practice, but hopefully this lecture will, will kind of uh, you know, facilitate that process. Uh, a few more things about patterns. They are objects that define algorithmic sequences but they are not the same thing as the processes that execute those sequences. So in, in, along these lines, patterns are often described as stateless. You, you know, you, if, you, if you create a pattern and then say next, 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 it won't do anything. It just returns itself, the pattern object. So patterns are, are classes that respond to the message as stream, which returns a new object, uh, a, a type of stream basically, a routine, a stream, something along those lines a stream or stream adjacent class, uh, which can be played or nexted. Uh, so it's, and, and this, this is a really nice design because the pattern can serve as a template or a score or, or some sort of generative device, which is not the sequence itself, but can generate any number of sequences from it. So you can have one pattern and then from that pattern spawn, you know, 10 or 20 or even more streams that execute that sequence. And they're all independent, much in the same way that you can have a blueprint for a house, and from that blueprint you can create any number of houses, possibly adding variations as you construct them, but the blueprint remains the same, and of course you cannot live in a blueprint of a house, but it provides everything you need to make a house. Um, what else do I have here? Okay, uh, just some setup code. This is uh, derived from uh, last week and, and a few new things here, but I'm going to start by booting the server. And uh, I don't know what that's doing there, that loop, we're going to delete that. Uh, so we have this routine. This is our note gen routine from uh, last week. It creates a sequence of eight randomly ascending uh, numbers, arbitrarily, I guess, note numbers, whatever those might be. It's just, they're just numbers. And it does eight in a row and then repeats the sequence indefinitely. So it always comes back around to 12 and then eight numbers. The increment is somewhere between one and six between each number. So this sh should be familiar. And we have a, a synth def, which um, uh, just to walk through this here, we have a, a frequency argument, which for convenience, I'm just storing in a variable named freak. Um, it is multiplied by four unique random numbers treated as semitone transpositions. So uh, this, if this is 100, this turns into four, an array of four values that are all close to 100. Um, I have a cutoff frequency for a low-pass filter, which is some multiple of the fundamental frequency. By default, it's twice the fundamental. So we have a pulse wave, uh, which, whose frequency is an array of four random values clustered around the base frequency. We have the ability to specify the width of the pulse oscillator. Um, this is the amount of on versus the amount of off in the up-down shape. 
Uh, we pass it through a low-pass filter. We create and apply an envelope. We pan, oh, I, I should have, here we're summing the four pulse waves down to monophonic. So, you know, we create four frequencies, but then mix them down to monophonic. Apply the envelope, pan it in stereo, and then send it out. So it sounds like this. And we have a few additional parameters. The, you know, the release can be long. Uh, I forgot a comma, excuse me. And here we'll change the width a little bit. This is a value between zero and one, and 0.5 is a square wave where it's equal up, equal down. Should keep the frequency constant here. And we'll set the uh, harmonic to be, I don't know, eight. Just a kind of timbral shift. So just a little bit of options here. This will, hopefully we'll get uh, far enough into this lecture where we'll come back and deal with this synth step. But for now, I want to introduce some patterns uh, just as pure numerical generators. And uh, so, so there's, there's different types of patterns. Um, some of them are value patterns, which means they define sequences of values. And usually these values are numbers. Not always, but most of the time these values are, are numbers. Um, so what I'll do is I'll upload a more complete uh, code file of you know, uh, uh, commonly used patterns, which you can use as a reference guide. And I'll introduce some of them here. So the first one I'd like to introduce is P seek. Uh, let's say, let's do it this way. So remember when you create an object, uh, we're omitting the new here, uh, but we're making a new instance of P seek. You can press shift command space inside of the parentheses to get a little pop-up text of what this particular pattern expects. And it expects uh, three things. First, it needs a list as an array. Uh, we'll just give it some numbers. Then it needs a number of repeats. It's going gonna, it's gonna to read through these values in sequence, which is why it's called pseq. And it's going to do it uh, some number of times. And last, we have an offset, which is an index into the array telling it where in this sequence to start. And the default is, is zero, so we'll stick with zero. And uh, we'll even do this just to be extra clear. So we make a PC called P. From that pattern, we generate a stream called Q. And so Q is the process that we can call next on. And that was four repeats, so now we're at the end of that stream, and there's nothing left. Uh, PSeq is often used as a number generator, but the things in the array can be anything. It can be symbols, can be uh, yeah, strings. So here we have, it's just going to spit these things out. And when it gets to the end, it just starts returning nil. Just like routines, uh, patterns that have, been, that have been converted to streams can be reset, and then they start back to the beginning. So same, same principle as routine. The benefit here is that we're taking advantage of these, uh, what I've already described as pre-packaged algorithmic units. And you remember last, last time we, we had to manually build this custom routine with all of this internal logic, with uh, you know, iteration nested inside of iteration, um, and we can probably cobble together a few patterns to recreate this with substantially less code. And maybe we'll get to that. But let me introduce a few more patterns first. Uh, P rand takes uh, a list and a number of repeats. and it will simply randomly choose an item from that array.
And this, uh, the, for any, any pattern, value pattern that accepts a repeats value, that can be a number between one and a very large number, or it can be inf, which means do this forever. You can call next on it forever and it will never exhaust its supply of values. There are a couple of variations on prand. There's pxrand. This is a, a variation which picks randomly, but will never pick the same item twice in a row. So we got 20. This means the next one is going to be either 10 or 30. Right, now it's going to be 20 or 30. So it kind of jumps around, but it will never do the same one twice in a row. pxrand is not smart in, in the sense that it looks inside the array and checks for duplicates. So if you had something like this, uh, pxrand is unaware that some of these items are equal, so it's, you're very likely in this case to get some repeated values. So it doesn't know if the items inside are equal, it just knows their indices, and it never picks the same indexed item twice in a row. Another variation on rand is uh, pwrand. The w stands for uh, weights or weighted. And this one needs an additional array of weights, which must sum to a value of 1. And it will treat those as uh, weighting figures, so favoring certain items in the array. So we could say something like 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.08, and 0 0.02. So these, we can just confirm, do in fact, oh, they don't. Look at that. I cannot do math. Let's do this and this. See, this is why we check our math. So we have a, this means 80% of the time this stream will output 10, 13% of the time 20, and 7% of the time 30. So here's, while I'm here, we'll introduce another method. Uh, next n will give you the next n items, and you provide. So this will give us 40, an array of the next 40 items. And you can see they're mostly 10s, because that's how we've weighted the choosing algorithm. If you have a lot of items in here, and you don't feel like doing the mental math to make an array that adds up to 1, you can just say, oh, let's just put in some numbers that sort of feel right, like this. And you can say dot normalize sum. And this returns an array where the relative proportions of these numbers remains the same, but they've all been scaled so that their sum is 1. So this is a, a convenient trick to, if you have just a bunch of things you want to just kind of rough in the numbers, uh, you can use normalize sum to do the math for you. All right, one more uh, random array-based pattern is p shuff which takes a list and a repeats. So we're seeing kind of a familiar structure here. Uh, we'll do a, a, a syntax shortcut here for the array of numbers 1 through 9. Remember, this syntax gives us the array from 1 to 9. And we'll say inf. Uh, let's make it a little bit simpler. We'll do uh, 1 to 5, a little bit smaller. So uh, this one gives us a random order of the items in the list. And then it will repeat that order again and again and again. And a common question that comes up here is, how do we get pchef to pick a new random order each time a cycle completes? Because that's kind of an interesting thing to do. Like if you have a, a tone row or something, and you want to randomize the order, but always play all 12 tones in some order, uh, you can nest patterns inside of each other. So I think the following will work. I haven't tested this, but I have a good feeling about it. We're going to say uh, pseek. If this doesn't work, I have a backup. Um, so here what we've done is we've, we're using pseek, ultimately, a sequential pattern. And its array contains one thing, another pattern, a pshuf that picks a random order of the numbers 1 through 5 and does that once. So this PC does, embeds this item in its stream and then does it again, in which case it'll embed this item again. And I think it, it will, I, will, will I'm going to eat these words, but I think this will work. So there's a random order. 
there's another random order, which is different. So this is an example of how to get pshuf to do a new order every time, and it also demonstrates the nesting ability of patterns. And this is one of the most powerful things about patterns, is that they're like little Lego blocks, and uh, if you have you know, some, some random number thing, you can use that as a component in another pattern and use that in a component in another pattern. And so there's lots of possibilities for constructing these composite patterns. Um, the, the main challenge here is learning this language to the point of being able to translate relatively easily your algorithmic ideas into an expression of patterns. And hopefully that will just come with practice and as your familiarity increases. All right, a couple of, uh, I might go through all of these, we'll see. I mean, I think it's good to get all these on the screen and in the video here. P-series is an arithmetic series where we start at some value, we step by some amount, and we do this a certain number of times. So here we start at zero, we add 12, we add 12, we add 12, and that's four times, so we're done. And you can do inf here. Just keep in mind that this will spiral off into infinity, uh, uh, which may or may not be dangerous, depending on what these numbers are being used for. You can go the other way. Negative numbers are totally fine. Uh, you can also, uh, well, I will get back. Let me, we'll, we'll put an asterisk here and, and come back to it. If I forget, please remind me. But there's a, an interesting nesting thing you can do here. P geom, geometric, is a multiplicative series. So we start at 1, we'll multiply by 2, and do this forever. So we get 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Now this one is quite a bit more explosive, right, in terms of, uh, you know, amplitude. But... Uh, a nice, a nice thing to do here is um, set the multiplicative value to be somewhere between 0 and 1. And now these will converge on 0. Right. One musical application of PGM is to uh, reduce something by a certain number of decibels every time. So you can say uh, minus 3 dot dB amp, which gives you the amplitude ratio for 3 decibels. So if you use these values as amplitude, you have full amplitude, three decibels down, three decibels down, three decibels down, etc. Of course, you can also do that with P series, right? Just by using raw decibel values. So you know zero. Right? So you can you can always convert to amplitude over here. Same idea. This one is additive. This one is multiplicative. All right, so that uh, let's let's skip on ahead to uh, ranged randomness. The first one I want to show is p white. White is a reference to white noise here, which is just uniform randomness of amplitude samples, just, just complete randomness. So we can say uh, minus one. Let's say let's say uh, one to nine. Uh, so we need a low, we need a high, and uh, a number of repeats. This is functionally identical to this. Same idea. And just randomly picking numbers from the array, 1 through 9. This one is just picking random numbers from the range, 1 to 9. Same idea. Sometimes we want to range. Sometimes we want to pick from a collection of specific values. So they're not fully interchangeable. But in this case, we can express the same algorithm using two different patterns. And this is kind of the blessing and the curse of patterns, is that when you have a, a problem that can be solved with the correct algorithmic combination, there's usually like three or four different ways to do it. Um, and as long as you find one that works, that's really all that matters. Right? You don't have to find that if you're a, you know, obsessive compulsive about this, you can find the most optimal, but really it doesn't really matter. You can just find one that works and, and go with it. With P white, if the low and the high are integers, the output will be an integer. And if either one of these is a float, then the output will be a float. And this is consistent with how R rand works. This is always going to be numbers like this, integers, and now they're always going to be floats. 
So we can just replace this with a 0 .0, 9.0, and now we have ranged randomness, you know, with very, very fine amount of resolution. Um, R rand is to X brand as P white is to P X rand. So that means uh, P X brand. Uh, very much the same idea, except it always outputs floats and it has an exponential like distribution. So it's going to favor values towards the lower end. You can see a bunch of threes, twos, and ones. So it's going to be relatively rare that we get something close to nine and relatively common that we get something close to one. Let's say a thousand or 10,000 here. We're going to see most of these values relatively low. This is good for generating amplitude or frequency values because of our logarithmic perception of those. I'm going to present these three, but I'll let you um, look through the help files. But uh, P brown is Brownian motion, so you give it a range, but it will never deviate from the previous value by more than plus or minus the step value. So this is a way of getting randomness that kind of take, charts a path through a range rather than just picking sort of randomly. P LP rand, I'm not actually sure what LP stands for here. Uh, I think it means low probability or low something. You give it a, a low and a high and it will pick two numbers with a uniform distribution and choose the lower one. So it's a way of random number generators which tends toward low but is not an exponential distribution, it's just a different algorithm. And P H P rand does almost the same thing, but picks the higher of two random values. So just uh, oh, there's another one that I kind of discovered recently. Uh, P mean rand. This picks random values that tend toward the center of the range. Sometimes really good for panning. If you want to pan things and don't want a lot of side activity, you just kind of want to focus around the center. Great, uh, great example of of a pattern that makes sense. All uh, right, and then a uh, couple other utility patterns which you might find useful. Uh, PN repeatedly embeds a pattern. Uh, this is, I, it's, I haven't really found a, I'm sure there are examples exist, but I'm not exactly sure what advantage this has over PSeq because we just, we used PSeq to repeatedly embed PSHUF. So I, I think there's lots of situations where PN and PC can be kind of interchanged. But just uh, to give you an example, PN does not need the array brackets. This is just, um, we provide a pattern and a number of repeats. I'm not sure off the top of my head what key refers to here. But uh, this, there's a random order of one through five, another random order one through five. So. Same idea. Uh, P dupe is uh, you give it uh, a duplication number and uh, let's, let's actually follow our structure here. And it will make uh, it'll make copies like a, it'll it it uses this pattern, but then outputs th that pattern's value uh, this many times in a row before picking another before getting the next value from this pattern. So it's a way of creating uh, repeated copies of um, uh, all right, and then. Uh, one, one last pattern, which sort of seems to confuse people sometimes, but it's really quite a very simple pattern, uh, p-funk. p-funk evaluates a function and embeds the returned value of that function into the stream. So just to keep it very simple here, we'll just say the number two. And I forgot a semicolon. And this is just going to evaluate the function. Okay, the result is two. So we're going to just 
keep doing two, right? Not, not a very interesting example, but sometimes you might have a, a kind of a complicated algorithm that you're having a hard time expressing using patterns. But if you know how to write it using, using basic language side methods like rrand and xbrand and dot choose and all that kind of stuff, you can just write it here and you can make it as long as you want. So you can say var num, num equals four, num equals num plus uh, some random value, um, num equals num dot neg. I mean, this is not gonna be a really compelling example, but I'm just trying to demonstrate basically what's going on here. Num, uh, let's do uh, <laughs> num equals num <laughs> uh, plus num is prime as integer. So this is gonna say, is it prime, true or false? Uh, if true, it becomes a one. If false, it becomes a zero. Just making stuff up here. And then we get some numbers out of it. Because every time we run next, it's going to say, okay, number is four. We add a random number. We check if it's prime and possibly add one to it. And that's our pattern. Now, maybe we can do this with pattern objects, but it doesn't really matter because, again, it's all about finding the quickest, easiest solution, the one that makes the most sense to you. Uh, and I think I'm going to leave it there. I think there's a couple I'm overlooking. Uh, Oh, you know, there's one more, one more. And then, then I promise we're done. Uh, I really like the name of this one, P Lazy. It's a lot like P Funk. This is this is the one you use if you don't feel like doing any work. No, it's it's not quite not quite like that. Uh, P Lazy evaluates a function, and that function is supposed to return a pattern, and that's the pattern that gets embedded in the stream. Uh, let me see if I can come up with a good example here. Uh, let's, let's say here, okay. Let's say we want to embed, uh, uh, we, we want to pick a random, <laughs> I want to do this correctly. Uh, Okay, uh, let's do, I don't know if this is gonna work. All right, so if we say, uh, I wanna do this sequence somewhere between one and three times. Now this, this isn't gonna quite work correctly because what happens is when we create this pseq, this rand gets evaluated. It's gonna, it's gonna turn into some hard value and that's gonna be permanently baked into this pattern. So if we do uh, this and say q.next, okay, so it picked one. So it did this sequence once. If we reset this and start again, it's not gonna pick a different number. And just because we reset it does not compel the stream, because the pattern and stream are separate objects. The pattern has been defined. And this, on our, on when we evaluated it, became a one. So we can reset the stream as often as we like, but it's always gonna run this sequence once. This is an example of where plazy sort of gets, uh, sort of becomes a little bit useful. Because so if we take this uh, pattern and put it in here, now what we're doing is, is uh, wrapping this pseq in a plazy. So when we call next, the p lazy is going to evaluate its function and return this pattern. And because we're actually evaluating this function, it's going to you know, interpret the whole thing again and pick a new value. So if we say, okay, so that time it picked two. So it did two repetitions. Now it picked one, see? So it, it's a way of forcing a pattern to come into existence again. If you're having trouble, you know, there's, there's situations where it is actually really quite handy. Uh, I, I'm still working on a really compelling example that's simple and, and gets its effectiveness across. But hopefully this kind of gives you an idea of what it might be useful for. So let's now go back to this, right? And what I'm trying to show here is that, yes, we can build a routine 
with uh, just the right logic in order to output a specific sequence of values. But we're not taking advantage of patterns here. And what I'd like to do is try to build this sequence, one that starts at 12, adds a random number between 1 and 6, uh, and outputs 8 values, and then resets and goes on forever with patterns. So if you're uh, re-watching this video, now would be a good time to pause and try to do it yourself. Then, and let's, let's all you know, take, uh, take 30 seconds and um, try to, uh, you don't have to actually type it out, but you know, how would we nest patterns and use a sort of combination of patterns to get this here? Which of the patterns we've covered seems like it might be useful? I guess it's kind of an advanced exercise here. It's suddenly asking you to jump into the deep end here and, and compose with patterns. So there's obviously a, uh, an arithmetic series of some sort going on here. We, so we were uh, adding a number to a number and, and then sort of getting the next one, adding another number, adding another number. So P series is definitely something to consider. This is, this is the one that you know, starts at a number. We incrementally add some value. Um, so if we start at uh, negative 12 and add 2 and go, you know, 8, this is uh, already kind of close. Uh, yeah? Can you make the step of the P-series into another pattern? Well, it's definitely, we want to try that. Yes, that's a great instinct. We want to try, can, I mean, we, we can't do this. This won't work. Um, uh, yeah, a pattern is the way to go, but just to demonstrate that this won't work, this is, has the same problem of the P-lazy example, where it, there, it just picked two. If we create it again, that time it picked four. Right? So we, this is not quite right, but it, can you think of a pattern that does something similar? P what? Right. And uh, how many repeats should this P white have? Infinite would work, because the outer pattern has a finite number of repeats. So it really doesn't matter if this P white goes on forever, because the P series is going to stop after 8. So that looks good. And then we're, so what, we need one more step here to make this random sequence of eight values that always starts at negative 12 repeat itself forever. So how would we do that? PSeq, let's try PSeq. I think that would work. So if we say PSeq, and uh, remember that PSeq needs its list to be in an array. And then how many repeats? Infinite, Infinite right, because we want it to go on forever. All right, fingers crossed. So that looks good. It should go back to negative 12 here, and it does. And it's a new random sequence. So we've done it. We've just rewritten our routine, which is up here, using uh, quite a bit less code. Um, so now we, uh, we have this number generator, which we can reset at any time. And so now if we say synth pulse, uh, we'll the frequency to be q dot next. And this is going to be negative 12, etc. So uh, we want to add this to some base frequency value, probably, and treat that as a MIDI note number and convert it to cycles per second. So very good, right? Uh, we could also make another pattern to control the width of the pulse wave or the release time, and then pipe that in here with, uh, you know, rel uh, stream dot next, you know, whatever, whatever the release could be. So you can you can make all of these cute little handy algorithmic sequence generators that generate numbers, and then funnel them into a synth call, and then voila, you're creating algorithmic music. And uh, that's kind of the, the basis of these, these value patterns. So this is a, a good uh, you know, opportunity when, on rewatching this video to, to pause and you know, add, make, make two or three other value patterns, supply them for other arguments for the synth, and then you know, just create these synths. So maybe you can put this inside of a routine with wait times 
and play that routine, and then you have this autonomous algorithmic synth generator. So lots of cool possibilities there. All right, we're going to switch gears and talk about a class called event. Now, an event is basically a type of collection. Uh, it, it's one of its distant parent classes is collection, uh, I think, right? Uh, maybe, yeah, right. Now, collection is a large, has a, is a, a, a parent class that has many, many children classes, including array, uh, list, bag, set, arrayed collection, sequenceable collection. It just goes on and on and on. We don't really use collection, but it is, it, it's, um, in the abstract, it's just a, a, a you know, a, a class, an object that contains a collection of data. So array is a good example. Event is also uh, a type of collection. Uh, but unlike arrays, which are indexed collections, where the objects exist in a specific order, event is an unordered collection, and the organizational structure is that each item has a unique name. So it's a, it's a named space, basically. And event also has a, a literal syntactical representation. So we don't have to say event.new, although we can. Um, a preferable uh, way to create an event is to use parentheses. So I'm going to copy an example that uh, is, is in my, the, the book that I'm working on. Uh, we're going to use an event to model the fish in an aquarium. So we have some number of guppies. We have, see, that's me accidentally trying to, I'm, I just, what I'm doing is, what I'm doing is this, typing my name. I can't type an FI without my fingers automatically <laughs> typing my, yeah, we have three goldfish. Yeah, minnow four. Okay, so this is basic uh, event syntax. So we've created an event. Uh, the parentheses are sort of overloaded here as, as a, a symbol because we also use them to encapsulate multi-line block of code. It doesn't mean that this is an event because an event is a parentheses with a symbol, colon, value, or you know, anything like that, uh, separated by commas. And you can see already that it's unordered. When it appears in the post window, it's in a different order. So there's no first item, second item, third item. Uh, it's just that each value is addressable by a name. So we can say, how many minnows do we have in our aquarium? Four. Right? And we can say, oh, we just went to the store and we bought uh, three more goldfish. Right? So what we've done is we'd say, okay, the, the item at this key, I mean, these, are, these are symbols, these names, but uh, conventionally they're called keys. So the, the item at the goldfish key set it equal to itself plus three. And so now if we say how many goldfish are in our aquarium, there's six because we got three more. Right? And if we get a new type of fish, what's a good, what's a type of fish? Beta. What is it? A beta fish. Beta? Is that B-E-T-A? Okay, and how many? Two. Two. Right. So we just say, you know, this, this key doesn't exist, but the way events work is you can just spontaneously create keys, and we've added um, uh, two more, two, two new fish, two beta fish. Yes? Is there a way that you can add a parameter? Yeah, we can add a... Everything else and have that value. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, maybe, it, maybe the betas ate all the other fish, and so now we can say, uh, uh, right, those are gone. Uh, yeah, brutal. We are not good fish owners. Oh, I know. It returns. It, yeah, this particular method returns the number of fish that were eaten. So now if we say E, it's just the two beta fish. Yeah. I, we, we could have also changed the, the number of goldfish to be zero, right? That's, I mean, it's just, it just depends on how you want to model this. But anyway, this is the basic idea of an event. It's just a collection of unordered uh, values, uh, which each have a unique associated name. Now, one of the, when I say unique, I mean, you cannot have two, you can't have minnow four and then minnow seven. 
right? If you try to set minnow to seven or make a new item called minnow at seven, it's going to replace the existing key. All of the keys are, must be unique. That's a, that's a consequence of uh, events. Is this kind of like a, a dictionary? Yes. In fact, uh, event is a subclass of dictionary. Okay. Yeah. There's dictionary. There's identity dictionary, which is a, actually that's the um, superclass of dictionary, I think. I actually, I'm not sure. No, so identity dictionary is a subclass of dictionary. And then event, no, I'm getting it all mixed up. Uh, but they're all, they're all very closely related. Event, environment, dictionary, identity dictionary. These, what these all have in common is that they are unordered collections where each item stored in that collection has a unique symbol key associated with it. OK. Why am I telling you all about events? Well. Events are used to store things, but events are also used to model actions taken in response to a play message. So you can have an empty event and play it, and we get sound. And this is kind of crazy because there's nothing in this event. <laughs> how, how does SuperCollider know what to play and what pitch to play and how loud to play it and where to send it? Right? This, is, this uh, is possible because under the hood, there is a vast and complex and sophisticated um, event prototype structure. Um, so there are many different types of events, and each of those events models some sort of action. And the default action is to play, uh, it's to create a synth and play a sound based on some synth def. And uh, here's where I always sort of struggle on, on where to where to begin this discussion um, so uh, there are different types of events uh, that are all and this is you know this is totally separate here we're just making an event it doesn't have a type really it's just a collection of things but uh, if we want to leverage events to play sound um, we can take advantage of the fact that there are a bunch of built-in event types Uh, event, I think, oh, event, sorry, not events. And uh, I'm going to say, yeah, so here, here's an example of all of the types of events that exist. Some of these are going to look totally, you know, strange and foreign, but there are a few that are used so, so often when dealing with patterns and events to create algorithmic sequences of sound rather than algorithmic sequences of numbers. And so note is the one that I'm going to focus on. Note is actually the default type of event when you play an event, uh, which means we could say uh, type note. And uh, sorry, this has to be a symbol. And we get a sound. Um, and if we go into the, uh, actually, we're going to go all the way back to browse. Uh, we're going to go down to streams, patterns, events. So this is already kind of a clue that events and patterns are, at the same time, separate classes, but very closely related in terms of working with algorithmic sound. And at the very top, there's a, uh, a practical guide. It's a very excellent uh, read. It's very well written, and it's structured. And if we go down to chapter 8, where we see event types and parameters. So just to give you a little bit of a taste, um, you know, a common question is, well, maybe we're not going to read that just yet. We're, we're still a little bit uh, not quite there yet. But we can see that there is, um, uh, in this section called event types, there's a note type event. This is the default event type uh, used when type is not specified. It plays one or more synth nodes on the server. Uh, so uh, another type of event is the uh, rest event. This is also a pretty useful event. Well, it doesn't seem so, maybe, initially. But a rest event just does nothing for a specific amount of time. So we can play that event, and it plays a rest. <laughs> right? uh, so we note, play a note, play a rest. Right? Um, and then within the note event, there's a bunch of parameters uh, that I think this is in here as well. I'm going to have to hunt around. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, types. Uh, 
Uh, nope, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, but I will just show you some of the uh, keys that you can put in an event that you want to play. So uh, note is the default type, which means we don't have to specify it, and that will be the type automatically chosen for us. And actually, you can see in the post window, these are some of the keys that are in the default note type event. Uh, instrument. This is the name of a synth staff to use to create the synth. Right? The good question is, where's the sound coming from? Right? It sounds, sounds very specific and unique. And actually, it's in the source code for the event class. So if we look at the event source class, we can go down to just search for synth def. And there's a method called make default synth def, which adds this synth def. So it's um, a bunch of var saw objects passed through a low pass filter with a linear sort of trapezoid envelope. Or, yeah, I think that's what it is. I think it's a sustaining envelope. Anyway, it's just, just a sawtooth wave going through a low pass filter. It's, the reason this synth def exists is for convenience, so that you can like work with events and play them without always having to make your own synth def. You can just rely on this one just as a way of demonstrating stuff. Um, so we can uh, freak is a pattern, or uh, a key that's valid here. Uh, amp. Uh, pan. This one is it's working. Uh, and um, sustain is another good one. So this is actually kind of interesting because uh, if we uh, use synth to play the default synth def, it doesn't actually turn off because it's a sustaining envelope. So we need to set the gate to be zero in order to free it. But the event structure, the event paradigm, includes a key called sustain, which automatically sends a gate zero message after sustain number of beats have elapsed. So if we say sustain one, turns off after one second, turns off after three seconds. So it's kind of convenient because all of a sudden the process of turning a sustaining synth off is built into the playing mechanism. Let's go back to our uh, synth def here, which is at the very top this uh, pulse synth def, make sure it's added. And we can say instrument uh, pulse dot play. And I think this should make sound. Yeah. Now, our synth def has um, a fixed duration envelope. So the sustain key is automatically sending a gate zero message, but it's not doing anything because this synth def has an, an envelope that, that terminates itself automatically. But we can say uh, uh, env ADSR uh, gate. And so now uh, it's got a sustaining envelope, which means if we say sustains forever, let's turn the amplitude up a little bit. And uh, freak. And so the uh, sustain key, uh, let's, let's uh, bring this down here. It automatically turns off. Sorry, this is very quiet, I know, but um, here we go. And uh, one last thing before we wrap up for the day. When you play a note type event and you specify a synth def, you know, it's default, by default, uses the default synth def. But if, once you specify a synth def, all of the arguments declared in that synth def become keys that you can use in this event. So we can say uh, width uh, 0.2. Let's make this uh, louder and an even narrower width. 
So it's all working. All these values are getting plugged in. And if we put something nonsensical in here, uh, it becomes part of the event, but there's no synthdef argument named blurf, and there's no key in the underlying event paradigm named blurf. So it just kind of lives there in the event and has no effect on anything. Um, uh, so there's, uh, anyway, this, this is a good, I think, introduction to events. What we'll try to do next week is connect the idea of patterns with events. And there's a pattern called pbind, which defines a sequence defines and uh, it de defines a sequence of events. And when you play a pbind, it returns a type of stream called an event stream player, which is the execution of that pattern. So basically, the pbind will take a bunch of value patterns, shove them into event keys, and then play the event. And it automates that whole process to create this algorithmic sequence of synths. And it's a really powerful and flexible uh, design. Uh, and it forms the basis of lots of super collider projects, certainly mine. It's just a fantastic tool for creating arbitrarily complex sequences. Okay, so um, midterm due, 3 p.m. tomorrow. And uh, I haven't written homework yet, but I, I will, and that'll be due probably two weeks from today, all about sequencing. All right, so see you next week. <laughs>